On May 25, 1996, 19-year-old Cal Poly freshman Kristen Smart walked home from a party and was never seen or heard from again. The sheriff's department, police, even the FBI took part in the search for Kristen, but it never ended. She was presumed dead in 2002. Now, 26 years later, the last person to see Kristen alive, a fellow student, Paul Flores, and his father have been criminally charged and are standing trial together in a California courtroom. Tonight, we are taking a look at the trial so far and breaking down what we know about the disappearance of Kristen Smart. Good evening and welcome to Closing Arguments. I'm Ted Rollins in for Vinnie Palatan tonight on Monday. The trial for Paul Flores and his father, Ruben Flores, will resume in Monterey County, California. Testimony halted this week when one of the jurors could not attend due to an unexpected emergency. Paul and Ruben Flores are being tried at the same time, but they have separate juries. We're going to dive into the trial, what we've heard so far, and this case over the next hour. But first, here's Court TV legal correspondent Chanley Painter. She has a background on this case. Kristen Smart was a 19-year-old college freshman at Cal Poly St. Louis Obispo when she vanished in May of 1996. She was last seen leaving a party with two other students. Kristen's disappearance has remained a mystery. Search warrants were executed in February of 2020, 24 years after she went missing. Police searched the home of Paul Flores, one of the students Kristen was last seen with, also searched were his parents' home in Arroyo Grande, California, and property in Washington State. Then police went back to look at Flores' home again. The searches appeared to be the break the Smart family had been waiting decades for. After years of calling Paul Flores a prime suspect, police finally arrested him for murder. His father, Ruben, arrested as an accessory to murder. Paul and Ruben Flores were arrested after investigators found biological evidence under Ruben's deck behind his home. According to the AP, there were traces of human blood and stains in the soil. The Smart family filed a lawsuit last April against Ruben Flores for severe emotional distress spanning nearly 25 years. It alleges Ruben relocated Smart's remains with the help of Paul's mother, Susan Flores, and her boyfriend, Mike McConville. Despite all of this, Smart's body has yet to be found. Wow, they're outside, there's a caution tape over there, and I'm like, this is real, there's, you know, I, I see police undercovers and I see you guys. I just pray for the Smart family and, and I pray that they, they get some finality to this. Kristen was pronounced legally dead in 2002, but this billboard with Kristen's face has remained a fixture on the California Central Coast since her disappearance, serving as a daily reminder of unserved justice. The distance between the last place she was seen alive and the door to her dorm building at Mirror Hall is just about 40 yards. That's the voice of Chris Lambert on his podcast in your own backyard. It's a deep dive into Kristen's disappearance. The podcast renewed interest in the case and put pressure on authorities to solve it. On the walk back to her dorm, I think that Paul Flores took her instead to either his dorm or another location, attempted to sexually assault her, and I think that she lost her life in the process. Uh, Paul Flores, the defendant in Smart versus Flores, San Luis Obispo Superior Court case. Paul Flores has been the main suspect from the beginning, and he maintains his innocence. For years, the Smart family was frustrated with the local sheriff's department, but since a new county sheriff took over, things changed. Uh, we'll continue to focus on finding her remains, regardless of any court action. So we will continue the process of finding out where Kristen is. Uh, when I took office, uh, one of the first acts that I mentioned was re-examining starting from the beginning. Besides the podcast, there was also an army of Facebook supporters keeping Kristen's story alive. I think the best thing that we can do for Kristen and her family right now is what Kristen supporters like doing the very least but have gotten really, really good at is just being patient and waiting. All right, there's Chanley Painter. Chanley has been covering the case for us in California, and she has a preview of what we can expect next week. Here it is. 
Well, we can expect the prosecution's case to continue calling those key witnesses, those former students who were at that off-campus party where Kristen Smart was last seen to talk about their observations of her, how she was acting, who she was with, and more importantly, what Paul Flores was doing at that party and help walk her home. So that's where we expect uh, to pick up on Monday some of that key testimony. Also, we are expecting next week a hearing for a motion that was filed by a media coalition to unseal the record. This case has been under protective seal virtually from the beginning. So there's very, very little known about what's in the case file and what has been litigated back and forth. And a lot of the affidavits and, and information has been sealed. Opening statements probably the most that we've heard about the evidence the prosecution has because of the protective order. So there is a motion by a media coalition that will be heard next Thursday. All right, thanks to Chandler Painter joining us now in Paso Robles, California, content editor for the Paso Robles Press, Camille Duvall, and in Los Angeles, our friend, attorney and trial consultant, Adina Sayagdal, also with us. Uh, Camille, to you first, uh, this is a case that has haunted the central coast of California for decades, and now here we are finally in trial. Give us a sense of how Kristen Smart, not from the area, has not left the consciousness of, of people in the central coast yeah well, i think it's fair to say that for about 20 years she wasn't necessarily on the forefront of all of our minds um except for anniversaries birthdays and things like that definitely the first few years of the case um there was a lot of public interest everyone was curious what is happening and then it wasn't until again when the podcast came out things really came to the forefront where i mean it was the time of the podcast, you know, we're all listening to true crime. We're all have access to social media where we're seeing now and more connected to her story because we're hearing all these different little details about Paul, all these different witnesses that were there where before we didn't really have that insight. Um, and now we have it more insight too into Paul, who Paul was before and after Kristen. Um, so now it's just the only thing anybody can talk about here. Yeah, I actually, and Camille, I want to follow up on that. Is this, um, in terms of traffic, um, up there? I mean, there's no cameras in the courtroom, uh, but are people following this trial? People are following it, that's for sure. I know that um, I was there when they were doing searches at Ruben Flores' home in Oreo Grande, and there was, I mean, tons and tons of people there up the hill trying to watch um, every single day that they were there. I mean, there were reporters, there were just people who were curious. There were, I guess, internet sleuths and other podcasters and um, social media people uh, there. But uh, from the time I was at the courthouse for arraignments and things like that, there really wasn't that many people from the public and whatnot there watching and trying to see what was going on. Um, I haven't been able to make it to Monterey, so I'm not sure on that forefront what it looks like, but uh, I think for the most part, you, you just see a lot of reporters. Yeah, and, and, and there's a lot of, of readers, obviously. Uh, Dina, it, not a lot has changed here. Well, you know, for 20 years, uh, as Camille talked about, the pieces were there, and a podcaster comes and tells the story from a fresh set of eyes and just sort of lays it out there. Um, is What am I missing? Why, why, wasn't, why weren't we doing this 20 years ago? Yeah, that is a great question. And I think they could have done it 20 years ago. I mean, I think they had enough. They had the cadaver dog that smelled something in his bedroom. They had witnesses that she was all of a sudden more passed out than she should have been with the amount they saw her drinking. And we've seen cases where there's circumstantial evidence like that brought to trial. I think there's a big difference maybe now, you know, the Me Too movement and maybe the willingness of women to come out and talk about situations that happen to them. Perhaps we are more willing to think that there is somebody could have been raped and murdered, even if you know she was just leaving a party. So perhaps culture has changed a little bit. And of course, the podcast. But I agree, you know, they have more evidence. It sounds like it's sealed, but they have them on tape saying something. We know that. That obviously led them to bring the charges as well as what they found under the deck. So they got more concrete evidence. But I do think there was enough to have brought the charges back then. And the timing, you know, the memories of the witnesses, that's going to hurt them with how long they took. 
Yeah, it's going to be a much different, difficult, much more difficult case. Um, assuming that there isn't this big gotcha, you know, piece of evidence that they have now, which led to the arrest, which we will find out possibly Thursday when they unseal the record, but for sure during the trial itself. Uh, Camille, this is in Monterey County. Move because of all of the interest, right? Um, it, it was just too much. This the, the billboard's been on 101 for decades, and people know this case. But by moving it to Monterey County, is, is that a game changer in terms of, uh, do you think that that was enough to move it there rather than go all the way down to uh, where Dina is in, in LA where you have a larger jury pool? Um, I mean, I guess apparently they think that it's a big difference. Uh, if you're from around here, when we heard they were just moving it to Monterey, a lot of us thought, well, what's the difference? I mean, it's the next county north of us. Um, but apparently there's not a lot of people who are interested in it. I know just in our little bubble, we think, how can you not know Chris and Smart? How can you not know the podcast and have listened to that and not know about Paul Flores now? Um, but maybe outside of our bubble, it's not quite that important to people and on their minds and in their face all the time like it is here. Um, but it's a very similar county um, it, in its proximity to us. Yeah, this is just not that far down the road, uh, up the road, no. uh, Dita. And and you're, um, you're in L.A. That seemed would be a, a, probably a safer way to go just because... Uh, the jury pool is massive in, in Los Angeles County. Um, what, what are your thoughts on Monterey? Is that enough? Was that enough to, to move it out of the, just the San Luis Obispo area? Well, it's interesting because, as you said, I, I'm in L.A. and he actually worked down here in 2018, 2019. I spoke with somebody today who worked. He she he worked for her and she had, you know, stories about him kind of validating what um, the witness on the stand was saying that he was he was creepy. You know, they, the workers there all kind of felt that. So I'm not sure if you could go far enough, actually, if there if there was this interest in this case, he has been in the California. LA type area, Central Coast area for years, as we know, this is decades. And so I do think that the judge's point of moving it to Monterey because Monterey families aren't discussing this around the dinner table, the judge said, as they are, you know, in their original county. But you know, publicity is everywhere. And I think there's many people actually who have come in contact with him because of how long ago this happened. Charlie Painter's been in the courtroom for us, and one of the interesting things about this case is you have father and son at the defense table. They're both in the courtroom. They have separate juries being tried together. She talks a little bit about the interaction between father and son. This is a photo of, you know, what I watch when I'm sitting in the gallery when I was there inside the courtroom. Paul and Ruben are sitting side by side. They don't have their attorneys in between them. So that indicates to me that they're getting along, they're communicating and they want to see each other, right? And they are sometimes shoulders to shoulder, touching, talking, passing notes, helping each other out. It's really unlike anything we've seen. A lot of times co-defendants on trial together, Michael, aren't looking at each other. They aren't talking to each other, but father and son are, and it's really interesting. Paul also really is kind of like his co-counsel. Uh, Paul Flores will work the technology for his attorney, pass his pass items to his attorney when I'm in there. Uh, so it's just really an interesting dynamic. Mm, it, uh, interesting, uh, uh, very interesting. Uh, we need to slip a break in here. I want to thank uh, Camille Duvall. Thank you for your time. Appreciate it. Dean is going to stick around for us. Uh, we're going to have more on the Kristen Smart case for the next hour. Before we go, here's a preview of what is coming up next hour on Closing Arguments. <laughs> In Summit County, Ohio, Erica Stefanko was convicted of murdering her ex-husband's former partner in what prosecutors say was a bogus pizza delivery plot. Now, Stefanko's conviction has been overturned because of the remote testimony of her alleged co-conspirator, her ex-husband. We have the latest on Erica Stefanko. I'm not the one who strangled her, sir. Comfort Technology. It's been nearly 30 years since Kristen Smart went missing. She was declared legally dead in 2002. Her body never found. The last person seen with her was Paul Flores. Prosecutors allege he killed Smart while trying to rape her in his dorm room. 
Did you attend a party uh, at or near the Cal Poly campus in May of 1996? On the advice of my attorney, I refuse to answer that question based on the Fifth Amendment of the United States Constitution. While police suspected Paul Flores in Smart's disappearance, there wasn't enough evidence to charge him, and the case went cold. Years later, Flores moved south to Los Angeles, where, again, he came under the scrutiny of law enforcement. In L.A.'s Redondo Beach, Flores was being investigated for rape and was a suspect in two more cases of sexual assault. In the Redondo Beach case, the L.A. Times reported that in 2007, a woman had gone out with friends and had some drinks. She told police that after drinks, she awoke in a stranger's bed, naked and wrapped in a blanket. She had no memory of meeting the man beside her or having sex with him. According to her medical exam, there was no obvious indication of force or assaultive behavior. In 2011, four years later, the DNA sample collected from the woman's body was identified as belonging to Paul Flores. Initially, the woman, referred to as Rhonda Doe, could not identify Paul from a lineup, but now prosecutors say she is certain that it was him after seeing a photo of his driveway. In the end, Los Angeles prosecutors did not charge Flores with rape. After decades of suspicion, Paul Flores was arrested last April for Smart's murder. And during a press conference announcing his arrest, San Luis Obispo County Sheriff Ian Parkinson told reporters that investigators had discovered something of value in renewed searches of the homes that linked Flores to Smart's death. Detectives served search warrants at the home of Paul Flores, as well as his sister, mother, and father, all simultaneously. During the search warrant, detectives recovered evidence related to the murder of Kristen Smart. Flores was charged with murder, while his father, Ruben Flores, was charged with accessory to murder. Both pleaded not guilty. Two months later, prosecutors sought to amend the original complaint in the murder of Smart to reflect the two Los Angeles rape charges. Local station KEYT had this report from the hearing. Prosecutor Chris Prevell uh, argued the motion filed by the DA's office looking to add two rape charges that he says took place in Los Angeles County in 2011 and 2017. But the judge hearing the motion to include those additional counts ruled against the prosecution. Judge Craig Van Royen uh, made his ruling denying the motion to amend the charges saying they could inflame the jury and potentially uh, affect the outcome of the case. While the charges of rape won't be considered by a jury, evidence of Paul's alleged sexual misconduct will. California law allows prosecutors to admit such evidence to show his predisposition to commit sexual assaults. Three women, including the woman in the Redondo Beach case, are expected to testify Paul Flores drugged and raped them. Prosecutors hope to convince a jury that Paul attempted to do the same. To Kristen Smart. That was legal correspondent Chanley Painter with the background on Paul Flores. The judge in this case ruled that three women, as Chanley said, can testify who claimed that Flores attempted to have sex with them while they were under the influence. The jury has not heard any of that testimony yet, but they have heard from several of Kristen's friends. Vanessa Shields, who lived in Kristen's dorm, said that she saw Paul Flores staring intently at Kristen on one occasion, and she found it, quote, very creepy and unsettling. Another witness, Kendra Coed, was at the party with Kristen and Paul the night Kristen disappeared. She said that Paul, at some point, he started kissing me. I pushed him away. The prosecutor asked her if the kiss was consensual, and she said, no, I don't believe so. And the jury heard from Cheryl Manzer, who said that Kristen Smart was very intoxicated when they decided to leave the party and walk home. And that's when, she said, Paul Flores, quote, appeared sort of suddenly and said he was going to walk with us to the dorms. Paul had his arm around her waist and was supporting her. She was still wobbly and stumbling. Each time we paused, Paul said, I could continue on by myself and he would stay with Kristen. Still with us, attorney and trial consultant, Dina Sayegdal, and joining our conversation in Los Angeles, the deputy public defender for Los Angeles County, Philip Dubay, 
just off his battle with John Schneider last night. If you missed it, it was great. Uh, Dina, this case, um, these the judge's ruling to allow these other stories to come in, these other women that say, oh, I was drunk and he tried to do X, Y, and Z to me. Um, that's pretty powerful stuff, and in a lot of states it wouldn't be coming in, but California, um, there's a way in, and, and the judge is allowing it. Your thoughts on that decision? I mean, it may make the difference in the case because it, it gives the explanation. In fact, it gives the pattern, and that is why it's allowed to come in, not because it's showing him to be a bad person. We don't convict people for being bad people, but because they are going to show, you know, that the witness was testifying what happened at that party, how she didn't seem very drunk, then he was, and that he tried to kiss her. And probably these other women are going to speak to very similar situations of what happened to them. And as you start to create a pattern, if he did it to these other women, and as he, it looks like maybe he did it to her. And I imagine that's what we're going to see once we see the other three women. The, Witness testimony from the friends are going to become even more crucial. It will all fit together, I imagine. But Philip, that's a long way away from murder and, and hiding a body, is it not? Never mind that. It's a long way from proving that he even raped Kristen Smart. I mean, what do they have? They're bringing in a girl to say that Paul stared at her at a party. Okay? They're bringing in another girl to say, well, he kissed another girl at a college party. Okay, then they're bringing in another girl to say that Kristen was drunk. Does all of that equal sexual assault? It's ridiculous. And frankly, I think this judge may have done Paul Flores a, a favor because if he's convicted, this is coming back on appeal. The state Supreme Court has held just very, very recently that prosecutors cannot question witnesses or argue facts that are just simply not in evidence. And the reason why is that juries accept questions and arguments of prosecutors as if it were the flagship truth. They're the imprimators, if you will, of truth and justice. And to try to put forth a narrative with absolutely no evidence evidence to back it up, it puts the jury in a position to have to speculate as to whether or not a rape ever even occurred. I think it's a really bad call. Rape is just part of the storytelling, uh, Dana. This is a murder case, and there, he is not facing a rape charge, but it is the whole thing is storytelling, is it not, for the, for the prosecution, because that's what they have. They have a story that is intriguing and you've got dad and son sitting there at the defense table but there's not a lot of that um the, the physical evidence the, the grit that some jurors demand what's your do you, do you think the state has a chance to weave this thing all the way to a conviction I do. I actually think there's quite a lot of evidence. A lot of it's circumstantial, but it starts to really make a case for them. And the rape is important because, you know, they're at, what is the motive, right? It's not a, a family person that maybe has a vengeful, it wasn't a stranger who's trying to steal it, but he took somebody back to the dorm and raped her and then killed her. And we they have but the how cadaver. do we know he raped her? There's no proof that he raped her. I mean, there's proof that he's oh, creepy, right. right? And then he took her back to someone, to his dorm, or maybe he was helping her and she fell and hit her head. Um, well, is it fair to throw in this whole rape theme to the jury? Okay, and, and I have to say, I have to take uh, offense to the fact that it was sounded ridiculous that he raped her based on this evidence, because this is how date rape is proven. You know, they don't usually have a gun. They don't usually, you know, it, it's this, it is this. It's their friends at the parties who are testifying how this person acted not normal it is a testimony that this person acted passed out when she wasn't being seen drinking it's the testimony of him being the last one you know and his bringing her to his dorm that's the testimony of any date rape so to say somehow that's not enough to show rape and then you're going to have three other women who are going to probably testify to their, you know, being date rape drugged and sexually assaulted by him. And yes, maybe the friend's testimony by itself wouldn't be enough. But if they have these three other women decades later with a very similar story, I think that is enough. And really, that is why date rape really usually goes uncharged and unconvicted. And that's a sad part because it is much of a crime as any other rape. Philip, does Dina not make a good point? No, 
Uh, and Adina, I love you. You're beautiful and you're smart and I usually agree with you. But in this particular case, usually in a date rape situation, the rape victim takes a stand and testifies about how loopy she felt. She woke up and felt that something was wrong, maybe confided in a friend and a friend perhaps told her, oh my goodness, you may have been raped. And then they go to the police, they do a sexual assault examination. That is fair game, that is good evidence. But you do not have an actual victim here who's gonna take the stand and say, he did or did try. What about the friends me? who say that she was under the influence, that she was stumbling drunk, falling down drunk? How does that prove intercourse? Well, it proves it that she was, a, she was susceptible to um, what Dana was talking about, that scenario. The story fits that scenario of facts. Uh, not under the Rodriguez and the Navarro line of cases. It could be improper questioning and an argument. In fact, it could be considered misconduct. Dana? I think that if it was just her friend's testimony, I would give it to you. It would be very much of an uphill battle, even though it helps explain the prosecution theory of the case. But the fact is, is they're going to have these three women who not that long ago said that he did something very similar to them. And then it becomes, you know, I think just game over at that point, because if you're going to have a pattern, and that's what they're going to establish, a pattern of doing a very similar thing to a woman over decades of time, it makes it much more for believable for the jury that that was why he brought her to the dorm. You know, not because they were just going to have a long conversation during the night, but because he had this intent to rape her and killed her in the process and makes it much easier for him, them. All right, it's a fascinating case. There's just uh, there's not a, there's a great story, and there are pit, bits of uh, of factual information that goes to this narrative. But Philip also brings up good points. There's a lot that isn't there, uh, including sadly Kristen Smart, Dina, uh, uh, Dahl, and Philip Debay. Thank you so much for your an analysis tonight. We need to get a break in here when we return. Chanley Painter interviews the creator of the podcast we've been talking about uh, during this hour, the person that a lot of people give credit to for renewing the interest in this case and these new eyes. Did this, did he, did this man and his work lead to the arrests? We'll talk about that next. Dave. I'm Chanley Painter in Monterey County, California for the Kristen Smart murder trial. This is Court TV, your front row seat to justice. Welcome back. The podcast, Your Own Backyard, has been credited with bringing the disappearance of Kristen Smart back into the local and national spotlight. The first episode of the eight-part series premiered back in September of 2019. The series creator, Chris Lambert, re-examined the Kristen Smart case through dozens of interviews and witnesses, and even the detectives who worked on the case decades ago. Since the podcast uh, has renewed interest in the case, the longtime person of interest and his father have, of course, been arrested, and now Paul and Ruben Flores are standing trial. Court TV legal correspondent had the opportunity to sit down with Chris Lambert. Here's some of their conversation. I started making a documentary about this missing girl from near my hometown like four years ago now. And at the time that I was doing that, it just felt like there hadn't been any public progress in the case for a long time. It felt like something that needed to be talked about. And at no point did I see it getting to anything happening in court. I didn't think that judicially that it would ever play out in this way. I just thought it's important that this story be documented in a way and that people start talking about her again because it's likely that her body is buried somewhere near my hometown and nobody seems to be looking anymore. People I've, I've been kind of talking to, they, they still kind of hesitate because they fear there may not still be enough evidence here. Have you been hearing that or have thoughts on it? Um, I think everybody sort of differs in their feelings about that. I think everybody is hoping there's like a smoking gun, like they're waiting for like the courtroom TV moment, like they they want that. Um, this is a case that is largely circumstantial evidence, but it's unusual in that there's so much circumstantial evidence. I think the reason we got here today with the evidence that we do have, even though it's not definitive or forensic in nature, is that there's so much overwhelming circumstantial evidence that the small pieces of physical evidence we do have almost feel like just 
they, they just sort of segue from one piece of circumstantial evidence to another. And so it's just, it's so clear, like you can see the, the outline of what's there and it's frustrating that it's not more filled in, but I think they're hoping it's there enough that a jury can see it. In your podcast, uh, you did you ever try to speak to Ruben or Paul or any? Have you ever had any communication with that side of the fence, I guess? I, I did reach out. Um, I went to Paul's house. I think you hear it in one of the later episodes. I left a business card at his doorstep. He didn't answer. But I had read a lot of news stories that were like, we went to approach them and they called the police on us. Or we went to approach them and they took photos of us and taunted us and told us to leave. And so I knew that like I didn't have to put much effort into it. It's like, here is my business card if you want to get in touch. But beyond that, I'm not going to bother you because I know that you're just going to call the police on me. So I knew they didn't want to talk. They always have the opportunity to talk. They're very aware that I would be willing to listen. A lot of other people have offered them that opportunity as well. And so um, I, I did talk to members of their extended family, though, and it was interesting to me how many of them were willing to talk to me but didn't want them to know they were talking to me, which to me says, you know, we kind of know what's going on here, but we don't want them to know. What do you think of the defense case so far? You heard their openings. You heard their cross examinations. We kind of can pick up their themes of where they're going. What do you make of it? And uh, I hear a lot of the smart family that displeased with kind of putting Kristen on trial too. Yeah, I think the defense's case is the same that the Flores defense has been all along, which is he went that way, she went that way, and just sticking with that. We don't know where she is. Where's the body? Where's the body? He went that way, she went that way, and. They want to make the state prove their case, which is understandable, um, but the defense doesn't seem to hold a lot of weight under examination. The more that you have all these people testifying as to ty the type of behavior that they saw exhibited, um, Paul's interest in Kristen the night that she disappeared, Paul being the last one seen with her, as well as when you get into like the injuries he had later that weekend, the fact that he lied and then he admitted that he lied about those, it's just, it all starts to add up. And so with the defense, I feel like they're kind of resting on, well, prove it. It's where's the body then? And I think I think the prosecution stated pretty strongly in their opening, you cannot reward somebody for being good at hiding a body. We don't have her body, but we can't reward somebody for being good at that. All right, let's bring in some investigators who will help us through this. Joining us in Los Angeles, California, retired FBI special agent. Bobby Chacon, and in San Diego, California, retired director of the San Diego Police Department Crime Lab, Jennifer Shen. Uh, Jen, to you first on this, the uh, idea that a podcaster and renewed interest from a community can push a uh, an investigation forward might be received with a little bit of bristling by law enforcement. Mm -hmm. But is there some truth to that? Do, do, is, is a case like this that does get a push? To, um, you know, you have an elected sheriff in this in this um, community. Does it help? You know, it absolutely does help. And one thing to remember is the police work for the people. They work for the citizens, and they're trying to solve crimes to make the you know the citizenry safe. And so a lot of that comes from interviews and out talking to people and developing resources and sources. So when you have someone who's willing to put that case out there and gender a lot of interest again, then you have the ability to go to your superiors as a law enforcement person and say, hey, I would like some extra resources to follow this up or here's some new creative ideas. I'd like to take a look at this. So it actually is a really great idea. And I think he did the Smart Family just a huge service by doing this sort of thing. Bobby, do you agree that, that that extra pressure does help, especially with someone who is eager within the department to keep going? Oh, yeah, I, I can verify that it helps. I mean, I had cases like that in my career that, you know, I couldn't generate um, support for in, in the upper ranks. But, but you know, as soon as it got some publicity and as soon as the media kind of picked up on it and now, the you know, now I didn't have podcasts in my day, but now that the podcast can generate that kind of publicity in the media, um, that has an effect on the upper levels of law enforcement that then filters down and guys like me at the bottom get the resources that we've been asking for for years. Um, but in this case too, remember, there have been, this is not a case that was dormant for 25 years. There was some activity back in 2016. Um, that's when the FBI got involved that they started tracking 
tapping phones or they may have been a wiretap. Then it began in 2018 or 2019. So you had kind of fits and starts to this on the law enforcement side. But certainly when the podcast started in 2019 and, and that really got the community energized behind this case is really when you saw things start to take off. They were a force multiplier, what we call a force multiplier in law enforcement. We don't have the resources sometimes to do it, but, but to out in the community, if you can get people talking about a case, if you can get that support, boy, that's everything. Yeah, absolutely. It makes sense. Back in 2016, you're right, three years before the podcast, they were up digging on the hillside in San Luis Obispo. There was always been a, a community sense that this uh, needed to be solved, and it still uh, is there. They're still looking for Kristen's body. Um, so to, I guess, to give all the credit to Chris Lambert would would really, you know, it would not be right, and 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 a, and a disservice to those people that were within the department, Jen. But um, it, it did make a difference at, at the end, a little bit at at some point. However, the bottom line here is all of this talk, and we think Paul and Ruben did it. That only goes so far. You need the um, you need the the physical proof. A jury needs to feel comfortable beyond a reasonable doubt, especially in a murder case. How devastating is it for an investigation to get this old? Um, you know, it, they yes, they went at it early on, but there was a lot of criticism of the early investigation in this case. And as the years go on, you do lose a lot of potential physical evidence. Do you not? You, you really do. So these these old cases are so hard to solve. And unless you've collected evidence at the time that can be retested and retested as time goes on with better technology, it, it just becomes really difficult to even find evidence. So if you don't already have it, then you're really at a disadvantage. So, I mean, I think that was very clear with the blood they found in the soil. It was in the soil with, you know, all the little soil bugs that are eating at it all those years. I mean, it just decomposes. It's not good enough to do anything with. So, I mean, it, it is, it's very difficult to get a forensic spin on a case that's 20, 30 years old. There just isn't anything left. Well, we're gonna talk about what they do have and that ground penetrating radar. And that really seems to be that last piece of the puzzle that they needed. We'll talk about the significance of that with Jen Shen and Bobby Schoen right uh, after this break. But coming up 25 years after Kristen, Kristen Smart disappeared, um, the Ruben Flores is home. This is Ruben, this is dad's house where they looked at this uh, and they brought in this radar. That's what we're gonna talk about uh, when we come back. And here's what we're going to talk about in the next hour. In Broward County, Florida, the death penalty phase of the Parkland school shooters case will determine if he is executed or spends the rest of his life in prison. Next week, the jury will visit the scene of the massacre when they return to Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School. We have a preview. But we object to uh, any restriction on jurors being able to go inside of the classroom. Today. open the door I'm like holy like you know wow they're outside there's a caution tape over there and I'm like this is real there's you know I, I see police undercovers and I see you guys and I'm like, this is the real deal and then I started reading and, and yeah it was true that was the neighbor of Ruben Flores back in March of 2021 when a search warrant was served at Ruben Flores home using cadaver dogs and ground penetrating radar to search under the lower deck of their house in Arroyo Grande California <laughs> Archaeologists reported finding an anomaly in the ground underneath the deck. And according to court documents, the anomaly was approximately four by six feet, giving it the size requirements to be big enough to potentially be a burial site for a human body. And the soil in this anomaly appeared to have been disturbed. The archaeologists concluded that the hole had been excavated and something removed a month later after the search paul flores was arrested and charged with murder his father charged with accessory after the fact still with us retired fbi special agent bobby chacon and retired director of the san diego police department crime lab jen shen uh bobby was this it would you think this was the tipping point for prosecutors and investigators to hook up the floreses and bring them in well, it certainly looks that way, Ted, from the timing of it, if, if nothing else. I mean, they, you know, they've been waiting all of these years. Then all of a sudden they do this fairly major operation. They bring in some archaeological experts. 
they get their expert opinions and the reports and and that might have been the last piece they had other evidence um it's a cumulative thing right and and a prosecutor has to feel comfortable that they have enough so and i always got into uh debates with my prosecutors i always felt we had enough and they always wanted more and so i think that you know given the timing of the the charges in such close proximity to this operation, I would have to think you're right that this has something to do with pushing them over the edge and saying, now we've got enough. How, um, uh, Jen, do you have to think out of the box? You know, I mean, obviously they thought Ruben, the body was there. The body, we know the body was there. They searched multiple times. They couldn't find it. And then they come up with this idea of the ground penetrating radar because they, they've isolated it under the deck. Um, to what extent is it, um, you know, in the shower you think of these things, or uh, is it uh, around a table, your brainstorming? How, how, how does this process work? How does it end up that, hey, let's get an archeologist and some ground penetrating radar? Well, actually the cadaver dogs and the ground penetrating radar are not that far out there. They're actually things that are used fairly regularly in this type of case, but you're right. People sit around, they talk about what they have and they come up with ideas and bounce them off each other. You know, ground penetrating radar is a, you know, that, that costs some money and takes some extra uh, resources. So it's not always used, but once you identified a place where you think there were human remains via the dogs, then this is an excellent next step to sort of locate a disturbance, so to speak, in the soil. And they were able to determine that this disturbance was approximately the size of a grave. Um, so that would have been very, um, that would have been, as you say, another thing on top of the pile of evidence, I think, to tip them towards arresting the suspects. And Bobby, that relationship you talked about with, with prosecutors, that, that back and forth, um, a, this scenario is a great storytelling element for a prosecutor who's thinking, I need something, I need a little, I need something where this is perfect, is it not? And um, when you're in that situation, you know what they need, right? You know what the prosecutor needs before they're willing to go to trial. And that's what you're searching for? Yeah, and each prosecutor is a little different in, in what they want and how much they want of it. So as an investigator, I've always kind of developed relationships with certain prosecutors and we got along well, we were on the same page. And so I always knew what they needed, what they wanted and, and went out and tried to get it. And so, but but there is that back and forth. And look, I, I defer to them, obviously. They're the ones that have to stand up in court. Their reputation's online. No one wants to lose big cases like this on the prosecution side. It, it stains your career and all that. And, you, and you'll get one shot at a defendant because of double jeopardy right so you get one shot at these people and and if you take it too soon if you shoot too soon and miss that's it they're you're done so you have to be sure and and like i said there was always times that i wanted to go and the prosecutor no i don't think i have enough and so i you know they're the ones that have to stand up in court and make the case and so i think that you have some of that you probably had some of that over the years in this case um and then finally something happened and then 30 days after that operation, they filed charges. So I'm really anxious to see what came about, you know, during that operation. Yeah, last word quickly, Jen, the blood, the supposed blood in that soil, 20 years, is there anything there there, do you think? Well, they, there's enough there to tell that it's human. So a grave-shaped hole in the ground under your deck with human blood in it certainly is not nothing. So it's yeah. a great end to a story, I would say. Absolutely. And for jurors, uh, they're looking over at the table, seeing dad and boy, uh, and it's at dad's house. Makes sense uh, how he could have uh, gotten away with it because he had the help. It, you know, it wasn't just a college kid with a body. It's dad in his pickup truck coming to the dorm and helping him out. That's the allegation from the state. Thank you both, uh, Jen Shen, Bobby Chacon, uh, for your time and expertise tonight.